two quick announcements. I think first of all, this being a long weekend and also having our youth camp taking place out in uh, the outskirts of Lusaka, I was expecting to have a very thin congregation this morning. So I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm hoping that this is a sign that uh, Copperbelt people decided to come and visit Lusaka to catch up with funerals. Because I know a few of our own members have traveled outside town to catch up with family events. So if we are overwhelmed by visitors, you are most welcome. Let me also repeat the announcement that was made about this evening service. We deliberately are making an effort that whenever our uh, Bible college that we run, not the African Christian University, but the Lusaka Ministerial College, whenever it runs a block class and consequently has a lecturer from outside the country, that we also have a special student service where that preacher can then preach evangelistically to students. And that's what's happening this afternoon at 16 hours. We hope to pack out this entire auditorium with students. And as I was preaching a few weeks ago, let's remember that we have an opportunity that the rest of this country doesn't have. And it's the fact that Lusaka is the maker, M-E-C-C-A, of tertiary education in this country. Uh, they are being opened left, right, and center. Uh, and consequently, a lot of people, young people, are gravitating to Lusaka for tertiary education. And we deliberately want to, as it were, catch the wind in our cells by making an extra effort to take the gospel to them on campuses and also invite them to such meetings that they might come here and hear the gospel. So the plea that is being made by the campus outreach ministry, which is our arm here that reaches out to the campuses, is that our two buses will not suffice to bring in the, the students. Enough interest has been generated. And all you need to do is call up MacArthur. Um, yeah, the number is there again. Call up uh, MacArthur and say to him, where do you want me to go this afternoon? He's already sent me to Unza. He's sent my wife over to some boarding house near Zikas. That's all you need to do. And uh, he will tell you where to go. Uh, a lot of students these days don't live on campuses. They live in boarding houses. So if you have one or two spaces, that may just be enough uh, to pick up that student. And who knows? Today might be that individual's day of salvation. And who knows, you may be the means, just through your vehicle, of the salvation of someone who might be the next greatest preacher that this country might ever have. We just don't know. God works in mysterious ways. And he uses very simple means like going on to a campus or a boarding house and picking up somebody and bringing them to church. You just don't know what the Lord might do. So that's the appeal that I am making on behalf of our brother. He's not here as far as I know. Uh, they are out on the, uh, the youth camp, but he will definitely be here together with others to ensure that the afternoon service goes according to plan. Matthew chapter 7 and the first five verses. The Bible reads, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck 
that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Well, as you can see from the statement in verse 5, we are still dealing with our ongoing theme of uh, the lethal poison of hypocrisy. The lethal poison of hypocrisy. We've been looking at this subject for a number of weeks now, and I have deliberately been saying that I undertook this theme not because someone has whispered something to me about someone here, and instead of me confronting you about it, I decide I'm going to do an entire series of ten or so sermons. Uh, that's, it's got nothing to do with that. Rather, it's the fact that I want these messages to be primarily preventative. Because the way in which the evil one often deceives us is that he makes us think that there is some safe haven that you can go into where you can actually live in sin and comfortably so and then when the whole period is over, you come out on the opposite end and you are still victorious and somehow you are able to live a normal, victorious, progressive Christian life. That's a lie. Because sin, like cancer, is never satisfied until you are in the grave. It never is. It destroys, it grows. And in the end, it leaves you with scars. It reduces your capacity to live a life of true spiritual victory. And consequently, it's important for you to realize when the evil one is knocking on your door and saying, just, just, just. It's important for you to realize it's not just. This step you wants you to take the wrong way will lead you to many, many sorrows. The lethal poison of hypocrisy. We are currently in the midst of this series going through a, a section in which I am using a phrase, and the phrase is, you are a hypocrite if something is true about you. And so far, we've looked at at least three such phrases. The last time we did so, we were saying that you are a hypocrite if you lack spiritual discernment. And the emphasis there being spiritual. And we saw, particularly from Luke 12, how the Lord Jesus Christ was saying that people tend to, to be able to, to see into the, the near future with respect to the weather. They, they look into the sky just before they go out of the home and they say to themselves, I better carry an umbrella. Or I better carry a warm coat. Not because it's already raining, not because it's already cold, but they are able to discern, to draw a line, to extrapolate that this is the way it's going to be beyond this. And Jesus is saying, you are hypocrites. You seem to give deliberate mind and attention to these natural areas of life. And when it comes to spiritual things, you can't join the dotted lines. You fail to do that. You fail to interpret the, the signs of the times, as it were. What is happening and continuing to happen and growing, so to speak, when it comes to spiritual things. He considered that 
as absolute hypocrisy. And again, it's crucial, brethren, that we search ourselves. Is that the kind of hypocrisy we are guilty of? I spent quite a lot of time on that last time. Today, we're moving on to another saying, and it is this. You are a hypocrite if you are fixated on the sins of others and not on your own sins. You are a hypocrite if you are fixated on the sins of others. Now, whereas the hypocrisy we looked at last time is not very common, at least we are not conscious that this is a form of hypocrisy, this one is. It's a very common one. Often two people will be sitting, maybe at a funeral or at a wedding or some social occasion or maybe even in a bus and they are talking. And while they are talking, they are gossiping, often slandering other people. And the kind of things they are talking about those other people and even shaking their heads about it, if you know them, you are thinking, now come on, guys. I know so much about you that for you to be shaking your heads about your neighbor and talking about them, I mean, surely you are ten times worse. But of course, people tend to enjoy that. And it's that kind of hypocrisy that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about here. But this time, a lot more in the spiritual realm. Let's quickly look at this and see if we are guilty of it. And if we are guilty of it, may God help us to repent of it. Because this kind of hypocrisy is also lethal. It destroys and before you know it, you will be its victim. So what are we seeing in these words that the Lord Jesus Christ gives towards the end of the famous Sermon on the Mount? He is saying, first of all, that you are a hypocrite if you love to condemn sin in other people and overlook your own sins. The emphasis there being on the word Condemn. You are a hypocrite if you love to condemn sin in other people while overlooking your own sin. That's what Jesus means when he says in chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, Judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It is very easy, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, for you to listen to this sermon that I have just preached to you. And while you are listening to it, you are busy saying to yourself, yeah, I think that person ought to have been here to listen to what you are saying. That person is guilty of what you've just said, and the other person is guilty, and so on. Oh, they are terrible! And Jesus is saying, I'm not preaching to them, I'm preaching to you who are in front of me. And remember, he had said a lot of issues in this sermon. For instance, in chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 17, look at the way he puts it. Chapter 5 and verse 17. Uh, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then he makes a statement. For I tell you, unless your righteousness 
exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And he gives quite a number of examples to show us how our righteousness ought to exceed that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He deals with anger, he deals with lust, he deals with divorce, he deals with oaths, he deals with retaliation, that is fighting against our enemies, etc., etc. In chapter 6, he also deals with the way in which those who believe in the Lord lose their own eternal, their eternal rewards. He speaks, for instance, about the area of giving to the poor and the needy and how the tendency is, at least for the Pharisees, to try and do it so publicly that everybody says, wow, what a great giver this person is. He also uses the example of prayer. Instead of majoring in private prayer, you prefer to major in public prayer. So that again people can say, wow, what a prayer warrior we have here. And then he gives the example of fasting. Again, exactly the same thing. Wanting people to think that you are great. He goes on to speak about the whole area of um, avarice, that is greed, wanting to, to have things instead of being an individual who is, as it were, rich spiritually, rich as far as the things of the kingdom are concerned. And then the last thief of eternal reward that he speaks about is worry. Worry. Individuals who are always anxious about tomorrow. And he says to them at the end of chapter 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And how many people do you know who right now are not given to Christian service because they are worried about tomorrow? They are anxious. And how easy it is for you to sit there and be preoccupied with their sin. As you sit there listening, oh yeah, yeah, that person, yes, should have been listening to this. I think I need to send him a verse from the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is saying, judge not that you be not judged. Now the phrase, judge not, is one that has been twisted and tortured until the way we now understand it is simply make no moral judgment. In other words, if your neighbor is a single lady or a single man and lives with someone who is not his wife or her husband, you're supposed to simply sort of look, look the other way. Don't judge. Because if you judge, you will also be judged. That's the way we've come to understand it. Don't, don't make any moral judgment. Moral opinion. Don't say this is wrong. Now clearly, that is torturing this statement out of its context. Because let's, let's just assume that that understanding is correct. Let's, let's, let's read just these two verses and see whether it sticks. Do not say that what your friend is doing is wrong so that no one says that what you are doing is wrong. And in this case, I suppose that no one is God. For with the same saying that this is wrong by which you pronounce, you too will be told that this was wrong. 
And with the same measure that you are using, it's going to be measured out to you. In other words, the interpretation seems to be that uh, if you don't say that what someone is doing is wrong, God also won't say that what you are doing is wrong. <laughs> Try that one out. It goes right against the entire Bible and its revelation. God has given a law. And again and again in the life of Israel, in the Old Testament, he again and again stated it. This is sin. It is wrong. It is evil. It is wicked. And even on the judgment day, that's what he would do. With all of us, God won't say, well, you were not passing moral judgment, so I also close my eyes, come into heaven, come in, come in, come in. It won't happen. He has made it clear that sinners will go to hell. Listen to this. Revelation 21 and verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. He names the sins and says those who are guilty must burn for it forever. Rather, we are to understand judge here in terms of the action of condemnation. The action of condemnation. The judgment here has to do upon you realizing this is wrong and what you now do after that. That's what is being dealt with here. And it is very clear, therefore, that his point is to do with this sense of condemnation. The condemnation you are passing on to others. And he's dealing with the issue of hypocrisy, which we shall be seeing in a few moments here. Because you are passing condemnation on to others, you are even shaking your heads about it, and yet you are doing the same thing. And he is saying that that hypocrisy, God is going to make sure he pours right back onto your own head. That's the point he is making. And no doubt about it, we shall be seeing it in verse 3 down to verse 5. The point is not that you should never say the truth. We should say the truth. If your neighbor is living in sin, say it to them. This is wrong. Remember, John the Baptist said it to Herod. Friend, this is your brother's wife. You can't be sleeping with her. It's wrong. And of course, it cost him his head. But that's what our responsibility is. If your neighbor is pilfering at work, Tell them, my friend, this is wrong. You are stealing company time. You are stealing company money. It is wrong. Stop it. But just make sure you are not stealing company money and stealing company time yourself. Because that is what is being condemned here. But let's go on. So the point that is being made here is that we should not be biased with respect to sin, where you are condemning it in others and then overlooking it in your own self. Because the same measure, the same shaking of your head, the same ostracizing that you are doing unto others, if you are living in sin, it will be poured back onto your own head. Because remember, God is unbiased. Let's go on. You are a hypocrite. If you concentrate on sin in other people, I'm moving away from condemnation now, if you concentrate on sin in other people and 
turn a complete blind eye to your own. Turn a complete blind eye to your own. In verse 3 and verse 4, Jesus queries, he asks, this preoccupation that is there with other people's, I'm putting it in quotation marks here, small sins and overlooking your own big sins. And I'm putting that again in quotation marks. Listen to this, verse 3 and verse 4. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in yours? The Lord is, is asking serious questions there. Questions about our own hypocritical attitude. First of all, he's asking, how come you fail to, to notice your own sin and, and you seem to be able, very able, to, to see other people's small sins? And I love the picture that he uses here, the, the picture of, of a log. Here you are, you've got this huge baobab tree log in your eye. And in the meantime, I say, have you seen that speck there that, that needs to be, to be removed? Have you seen it? He said, how do you manage that? How? And not only seeing, he also queries the zeal that you have to sort out other people's small sins when your own big sins are unattended to. Again, he's using the, the, the log picture. Here is this huge mukwa tree log in your eye. And in the meantime, you're saying, let, let me help you remove that, that speck. When there's a log in yours, Obviously, the point that he is making is it doesn't square. It doesn't make sense. Now, when he's using the issue of log and speck, he's, he's using hyperbole in order to, to, to drive home the point. It's not so much that he's concerned about real big sins and real small sins. No! No! It is the fact that if you are spiritually alive, your sins should bother you. Whether they are sins in the mind, this should bother you. You should sense their weight, even if it's not outward sins. It can be pride, it can be lust, it can be greed, it can be angry thoughts, whatever it might be. It may still be in you, but it bothers you. It weighs you down. It causes you to go to God and say, God, forgive me for my inward sin. Forgive me that I should be thinking like this. Forgive me that my desires might be going this way. Forgive me, O oh Lord. It should be a log. That's the way you should feel. And yet here you are when you should really be sensing your sin and yet you are preoccupied with others. And that's what he is saying hypocrites do. Hypocrites do. And the reason is quite simple. It is a failure to be conscious of the eye of God on me. Remember what we've said over and over and over again. That the hypocrite is not a person who is struggling with his inner sin and then he's trying to worship and it's, it's bothering him and he's, he's crying out to God, God help me. And he's feeling, look, I'm just being a hypocrite here. That's not the hypocrite that's being talked about here. It is the one who 
is not conscious that God sees me. God is hearing me. God is noticing what is happening inside me. He's not conscious of it. And the reason for that is that such people are either dead spiritually or such people are in a bad spiritual state. And hence, the only thing they are conscious of are the sins of other people that irritate them. That's what they're conscious of. So somebody comes to church because they have a little bit more money than you. So they come to church with different suits each week or different dresses each week. And always boastful. Always. Always. Well, what about your own pride? Does it ever bother you that in more ways than one, you yourself are full of pride? When you were in front of your mirror that same morning, and sort of like, you handsome beast, you. <laughs> Don't you realize that was also pride? That's the point that is being made here. That you can be so fixated on what you think are other people's pride when it's really just irritating you. That's all. And not necessarily that they themselves are actually living in sin. So the emphasis is not on small and big, but it is on this painful consciousness of sin. And Jesus is making the point here that that's the explanation to these questions he's asking. You are a hypocrite if your own sins are not causing you to want to do something about it. You are a hypocrite. You are not so conscious of your moral failures in the eyes of God that you're trying to remove this log from your eyes. You're not doing anything about it. You are a hypocrite, you say. Or, if you've genuinely become a Christian, if your sin is not causing you, your painful consciousness of your sin is not causing you to seek sanctification, in other words, to be going before God and saying, God, this area of my life, deal with me and deal with me graciously. Here is my weakness, O Lord. Here is my failure, O Lord. Here is my sin, O Lord. Deal with me graciously. And it drives you to your knees. It drives you to the word of God. It drives you to the foot of the cross. It drives you to seek Christ that he might help you to be a better Christian. If that's not going on in your life at the moment and all you are seeing are the sins of others, Jesus is saying, you are a hypocrite. And this is not just an issue of unbelievers. It's the same with believers. Especially in church life because you get to start knowing one another. You know, you know the, the, this church, there's no love. There's no love in this church. But when someone begins to ask you questions, all right, let, let's just go through how you have shown love to others. Here were a few church members that had funerals. Here were a few church members that were sick and in hospital or looking after the sick in hospital. Here were a few church members that have had to fall out of school for lack of uh, fees. Here are a few church members. Just tick the boxes. Let's see where your love has been shot. No, but, 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 but I'm, I'm a new church member. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Everybody has an excuse. That one says he was very busy. The other one says he couldn't do this. So let's be careful. 
that we do not spend all our energies on others when we ourselves should be at the foot of the cross pleading for mercy that the Lord in our lives might be dealt with. The Lord Jesus Christ goes on to give counsel. And this is what he says. That those who are hypocrites should first of all correct the situation in their lives. Using the statement I've been using, you are a hypocrite if you first, if you don't first deal with sin in your life so that you can be better able to help others. Look at the way he puts it. Finally, in verse 5, with a scathing rebuke, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. First begin with the log that is in your own eye. Deal with it. Now clearly, he was looking at individuals that were listening to his sermon. And being God, he could tell that there were a lot of wrong attitudes as he was preaching and teaching. That individuals were basically saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. tell him. That one needs to get sorted out, and so on. And perhaps even being able to say, and so on. Passing it on to others. And he said, your first responsibility must be to say, what is that sermon saying to me? What is it about me that has just been exposed here? That's where you should begin from. Your own life. Your responsibility is to seek your own moral and spiritual purity. First take the log out of your own eye. Make it your number one business. You come to church, what is your prayer? Master, speak. Your servant is listening. Search me, O oh God. Search my heart today. Try me. I know my sinful ways. Deal with me, O oh Lord. That should be your attitude. What is your word for me today? Yes, I've come with a fellow sinner. That's your business with him or with her. I want a word from you, O oh Lord. Deal with me. And therefore, as he deals with the problem of anger, you are saying to yourself, Lord, that's me. As he deals with the issue of lust, you are saying, Lord, that's me. As he deals with the whole issue of truthfulness, again, you are saying, that's me. Retaliation, that's me. Love for, for ostentation, to be seen, to be something. You are saying, Lord, that's me. Avarice, greed. Again, you are saying, Lord, that's me. Anxiety, worry. Lord, have mercy, have mercy. Cleanse me, cleanse me. And on and on and on we can go. But God's word coming forth, you are not passing it on to others. You are recognizing with a tender conscience that that word is for me. I am the sinner that has failed God. I need mercy. I need mercy. And I need mercy today. He is saying there, deal with the Lord that is in your own eye. You see, the problem, once you lose a sense of the eye of God, is that it doesn't bother you. 
when God's word comes to you and is dealing with an area in your life that you are guilty of, you know what's happening in you? You're a little uncomfortable, shifting a little bit in your chair. And in your heart you're saying, come on, pastor, can you move on to the next subject, please? You are making us rather uncomfortable. Quickly change the subject. That's it. You, you, you don't want to be spoken to directly in your life. You quickly want to move on to something else so that you can say yes. Amen, preacher. I hope he's listening. And Jesus is saying, that's what's going to lead to your ultimate condemnation. That's what's going to take you to hell. Your failure to appropriate God's truth for yourself. To be able at the end of listening to a sermon to silence your heart for a moment and say, Lord, what is it about me that you've just exposed? Lord, please cleanse me. Forgive me. Wash my heart clean. But Jesus doesn't just say that your first responsibility is that of pursuing your own moral and spiritual purity. But it's also this, that when you do that, it increases your capacity to help others. It increases your capacity to help others. It clears your spiritual perception. And consequently, instead of simply being condemnatory on others, you want to be a means by which you can help them. Listen to this. Back to verse 5. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You will see clearly. Because the means by which God has dealt with you is the same means that you are able to bring to others. There is a loving gentleness that you have about you as you consequently deal with others. There is a genuine earnestness that cannot be missed. Now, very quickly, almost, by the way, that also explains why the first interpretation of judge not is wrong. Because if judge not means don't make any moral opinion about what is happening on, around you, then here's the question. How then are you going to help them? How? When you have removed that log from your eye. How will you help people if you're not supposed to conclude that they are wrong in their lives, morally, spiritually wrong? Clearly, friends, this popular view, I mean, almost all the time, I hear the statement, judge not. Has to be judged. The person who's saying is saying, ah, don't, 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 don't make any moral judgment. Who are you to judge? God alone should judge. I mean, someone is, is entering a car which isn't his. I'm not supposed to say, hey, kawalala. <laughs> eh? I said, well, you know, maybe he thought it was his car. Who knows? <laughs> Don't charge. Come on. That's far from what Jesus had in mind. Rather, the point is clear. It is this. You cannot be living in sin and then you put a huge curtain over it and then you are busy condemning other people's sins 
Because God will also judge you despite the fact that your sins are hidden behind the curtains. He will condemn you. So what he's saying is this. Yes, moral judgment must be made in terms of right and wrong. And then ours is to seek to help. To seek to help. To point people to Calvary. To say there is pardon. There is a free forgiveness for you. And then to say, I went there myself. That's where I'm a sinner that recognized my own sin and I went to the foot of the cross that my sins may be washed away. Go there quickly. Yours is not an alternative lifestyle. No, it is sin. Repent of it and flee to Christ. That's what he's saying here. Let's begin with ourselves. Well, brethren, I do want to quickly say as I close that beginning with ourselves can be very costly. Can be very costly. Jesus said in chapter 5, dealing with the subject of lust, which I want to apply generally. He said, verse 27, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I said to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. But this is the general principle I'm interested in, verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your one of your members, than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. I don't know what darling sin you are struggling with. But don't sit there calling it a small weakness, overlooking it, and in the meantime, calling other people's visible sins outright wickedness. Instead, deal ruthlessly with yourself. Deal ruthlessly with your sin. That's the picture that Jesus is bringing here. Whatever that sin might be, be ruthless. The picture of gouging out an eye, cutting off half your arm. I mean, that's cruel. But Jesus is saying that's better than for you to have your soul destroyed in hell. And one reason why we don't first remove the log from our eyes is because we tend to be too gentle to ourselves. We tend to postpone. And I find it a lot, especially where young people are in courtship with an unbeliever. They know the Aniko Young is wrong. They know it. But well, you know, he may get saved next week, you know. And then in the meantime, you are busy condemning someone with a bad temper. Come on! Begin with yourself! Go back to that unbeliever and say, Fiapua. <laughs> you should cry, but say Fiapua. But you cry! <laughs> Fiapua! Be ruthless with yourself. Be ruthless. Then go to Christ and say, Lord, my heart is shattered. Shattered. Heal me. Heal me, Lord. Heal me. And then you'll be able to go to others who are in similar situations and say, Jesus is a wonderful Savior. He is. He's dealt with me graciously. He will deal with you graciously. 
What I said at the very beginning, with that I close. This is a very common form of hypocrisy. And one of the reasons why it is a common form of hypocrisy is because we tend to appease our own consciences, don't we? By condemning other people. That's what we do. We know that if we don't show some kind of moral high ground and say that sin, that somehow it will look like we are not on God's side. Remember David, when Nathan came to him and told him about this story, some guy who took an animal, the only little animal that a neighbor had, when he had many and David said, this guy should die, man, die! Pay for it! And then Nathan said, hello, it's you. We tend to want to show that we, we are also spiritual, also godly, by gossiping about others, condemning others with their sins. Small sins. And that way we appease our own consciences. We feel at least God must say, yeah, there's some righteousness in you. After all, you're able to get quite angry with that brother's sin and that lady's sin. There must be some... God is not deceived. Even today, even now, he's speaking to you. And guess what? He knows what's happening inside you right now. He knows the struggle right now. As we are sitting there saying, God, no. No, 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 no. Don't touch here, no. He knows. When after this, you go and start condemning others. He knows. And he calls it hypocrisy. He calls it hypocrisy. Friends, as I said earlier on, no sin is small. Like a cancer, sin grows and finally destroys. Therefore, tear it out. Therefore, cut it off. Do so now. Make the resolution while you are still here. Say, Lord, this is sin. I want to have nothing more to do with it. It is sin in my life. Help me to bring this issue to an end that you may be glad with me in fellowship with me. The fact that you've not been found out yet is not a sign that God doesn't mind. He does. He does. And it's not just the sin that will destroy, but he himself finally opens the curtains and the skeletons fall out. Perhaps you've secretly tried and you failed. And hence your satisfaction with just pointing out other people's sins. My appeal to you is, in a church like this, there are individuals that can help you. They are. Individuals who also had a log that they finally removed by the grace of God. And they can help you. Instead of being a perpetual hypocrite, perpetual hypocrite, Today can be the day when you can deal finally a complete blow with the life of sin. Today. So seek help. Seek help. Someone may help you to find the sufficiency of Christ that liberates from sin. But above all, go to Christ. And ask him to wash you clean by his blood. Go to Christ. As we are singing in the last hymn. Happy if with my latest breath. I might but gasp his name. Preach him to all and cry in death. Behold, behold the lamb. Ultimately my role is to say to you. Go to Christ. Behold in Christ is everything that you need. Ask him 
not to pass you by today. Ask him. That as he has removed the logs in other people's lives, that he may remove the log in yours today. So that your hypocrisy may be over and you may be a great help to others. Amen? Thank you.